I had no idea that when you stood up and simply read the best crime statistics I could put together for city and county, that um, All the figures are somewhat mushy, but let me say for accuracy, uh, there are two numbers last week. We had 182 violent offenders released on bail and went on to commit murder in the course of 2.5 years. An unbelievable thing, that many on bail committed murder, and I didn't quote that accurately. And the latest number of backlog of criminals awaiting trial is accurately 44,369. To put this in perspective, let's look at the FBI statistics, which suddenly is also questionable. They go on a scale of one to a hundred, low crime being one, high crime being a hundred, low crime one, high crime a hundred, FBI data. Violent crime is composed of four offenses, murder, manslaughter, forcible rape, robbery, and aggravated assault. We couldn't compare Houston with every other city, so I took Chicago. (laughs) Chicago on this scale is 49.9. Houston is ahead, 50.4 in violent crime. The average in the United States for violent crime is 22.7. We are more than average violent crime in our city. Property crime as follows. National average, U.S. city, 35.4. Chicago, 46.3. Houston, 63.2. I rest my case that Houston arguably is one of, if not the most dangerous city in America, and that is a tragedy, tragedy, tragedy indeed. Someone said, it's against the law to shout fire in a crowded theater. And I added, you're absolutely right, but if there is a fire in the theater, somebody needs to shout. I redefined politics in its purest sense, if you'll remember. Mr. Webster talks about it covering the whole complex of relationships between human beings who live in a society. That's a pure definition. On that basis, Jesus was in the relationship business, right relationship with God, right relationship with ourselves, and right relationship with others. Therefore, Jesus was a great politician. We're not gonna live here forever. 
And I don't mean to say, look how pious the pastor is. But I want to tell you, I sought as best I could the mind of Jesus Christ. And I just thought when Jesus was in the temple in Jerusalem, and the temple, you remember, in the theocracy, composed of the political parties blended with religion. He saw the people being exploited in the selling of goods and animals, exchange of money, and on two occasions, he went in the citadel of religious and political power, took a whip, overturned the tables, and ran the rascals out on two occasions. And I just wondered if when Jesus was in Jerusalem and he would know of all the crime that was widespread in that holy city to the proportion that we're talking about, I wonder, would Jesus have stood in the temple and exegeted Leviticus? Or would he have spoken truth into power? I don't have any doubt. He would have spoken truth into power. Could we kneel together? Father, we not on our knees just because it's the thing to do, but we discovered that we stand taller in the world as we stand on our knees. I pray, O oh Lord, that you will bring healing to our city, to our nation, and to our world. And we know, dear Heavenly Father, because you gave us your Son, who gave us a prescription for peace and life and well-being here and forever. And Lord, we just pray there will be a turning to him like this world has never seen before. Lord, we are continue in barracuda waters today as we seek to address from your book, from your word, a part of the wokeness that is godlessness. You speak. Let me get out of the way is our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. Vance Packard, one of our greatest sociologists, in a book he penned, we are in the middle of a sexual wilderness. Some of his scholarly friends said, why did you lose the term wilderness? Why didn't you use the word revolution? And this sociologist said, I'll tell you exactly why. In a revolution, their goals, their aims, their desires, their ambition, there's a reason. But he said in a wilderness, like a sexual wilderness, said, you're lost. You have no sense of direction. Things are changing all around you and you don't know where you're going and where the end will be. Therefore, he said, accurately so, we are in a sexual wilderness. And many of us are there because we do not have a clear biblical worldview. What is that? Let me first of all, through a cartoon, show you 
the importance of having a biblical worldview, cartoon style, very profound. Listen and watch. This is Sasha. This is Sam. When they first met, it was just small talk about where to find the best coffee, the new high top she just bought, a book of poetry he found at a used bookstore, a new local band she discovered just last weekend, a zombie apocalypse movie he saw last night with some friends in his martial arts class, her homemade screen print t-shirt, and his favorite Chinese restaurant, which made them both hungry. So they got two orders of Mandarin chicken with brown rice, and then... Whoa, that's deep. But in the real world, life's journey ends with an ending. When you die, you're done. Well, yes, your body no longer works, but your soul continues to exist, don't you think? Your soul? No, I don't believe in ghosts. We're physical creatures, material objects, just a collection of highly organized atoms. When your brain flatlines, that's it, game over. So you don't believe in life after death? No. I mean, it's a comforting thought, but there's just no scientific evidence for it. I'd rather face the real world than believe in a fairy tale. Well, I agree with you, Sam. It's best to face reality. But it may be that life after death is reality. I mean, think about it. If life just ends at death, then everything we do or say comes to nothing. What meaning or purpose could our lives possibly have? Well, I guess my life has whatever meaning I choose to give it. I personally believe in truth, beauty, science, making the world a better place, saving the environment, freedom of speech, and, you know, tolerance. Yes, that's all well and good, but what does all that matter if it ends in nothingness? What are your thoughts about God? Which God? There are millions of gods. The God that's in the Bible. It's been proven that the Bible is just a bunch of mythology written by ancient desert nomads. But, you know, if faith in God makes you feel good, I won't argue with that. But I personally prefer a more rational, more open-minded approach to life. Here's what I believe, Sasha. You shouldn't think anything is true unless it's been scientifically proven. But has that belief itself been scientifically proven? Um... Sam, you and I look at life very differently. Yeah, it's crazy. It's like we're from two totally different worlds. Not different worlds different worldviews. A worldview is the set of lenses through which you see the world around you. It's a web of habit-forming beliefs that helps you make sense of all your experiences. Through your worldview, you interpret life in a particular way. It affects how you think, how you feel, and how you live from day to day. To understand what your worldview is, think carefully about the big questions of life. Does God exist? How did everything begin? Who am I? Why am I here? Am I living a good life? What happens after I die? Cabbages and puppies don't think about this stuff, but people do. Reflecting on these questions is part of what makes us human. In fact, every one of us has a worldview. What's yours? Big question. In the whole area of sexuality, where there's so much confusion, and all of us have been caught up in it, every single person here in different stages of life. So let me say, if I ask anyone to stand up who has been absolutely pure in their thoughts, Jesus said, if you commit pornea, adultery in your heart, it is as if you had committed. If anybody here is absolutely, perfectly pure all the way through your life and all your sexual questions, you've had all of them answered, I'm not going to ask you to stand. Because if there is such an individual on this planet, if they stood, they would just go right straight into heaven. So let's start right there and understand that all of us have had and continue to have 
conflicting views, lifestyles, actions, in the whole area of sex. Don't even nod your head. I think we agree on that. A counselor said that everybody, somebody walks in for counseling, you know two things. They have questions about God or about sex, about sex or about God. When I was a youngster, I don't remember the exact age, very young. I had female cousins, I had female friends in our neighborhood, and I played dolls with them. They'd have dress up day, I'd put on lipstick. I'd put on a dress and walk in with my cousins and everybody would laugh. I did this on many, many occasions. I've even played paper dolls, yeah when I was a kid. My wife, Lisa, brought up in a family with three brothers. She played all the sports with them. And she, one Christmas, her folks took her to the mall. She sat in the lap of Santa Claus. And before Santa could say, little girl, what do you want for Christmas? She said, I don't want any more dolls. She said, I want a football uniform like Bart Starr wears. (laughs) For Christmas, her parents very wisely gave us her a football uniform with shoulder pads so she could fight with her brothers and all in the neighborhood. Now, run the clock forward and if Her folks and my folks were modern. They would be woke. And they would think maybe Edwin should be Edwina. (laughs) And maybe Lisa should be Lewis. And then if we had gone to school or kindergarten, And that would be enforced there in order to be woke and politically correct and up to speed with modern psychology. Those identities would be encouraged and enforced and say, I want you to treat Edwina and Lewis just like everybody else. It's very important. But thank God we did not come up in that era. Many of you should, could share different kind of stories because my mom and dad and her mom and dad, they didn't know probably the term worldview, but they had a worldview that God was the creator. They had a worldview he created man and woman in his image. They had a worldview of marriage And Adam and Eve, and he performed that first ceremony, leave, cleave, one flesh, no shame. And the worldview is that God progressively revealed himself all the way through the Old Testament until God's peculiar people got so far away from him. At the end of the book of Judges, you read a devastating verse. Everybody did what was right in their own eyes because there was no king, no principles, no valid worldview. And the result was hundreds of years of might make rights and rebellion and decadence. And the scripture was silent until in the fullness of time God visited this earth in human flesh and came Jesus who died so that you and I may have an entree to God when we repent and confess sin and ask him to run our life as the commander in chief of you and me. And we live in that expectancy that the day will come that as God brought history into being, 
he will bring down the cordon of history and all who are in Christ will graduate to heaven and there will be a new heaven and a new earth on this pristine world in which we now live. That, in broad summary, is a Judeo-Christian worldview. And when you depart from that, you have left a valid life that God has given to every person, a life that is worth living. In Matthew 18, they asked Jesus a very important question. Verse one, at that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. In other words, who is number one? Who is the most important entity on this earth, right? Who's the greatest? Who's the most important? Who is the most valuable? Who is, has the highest priority of any living thing in this world? That's what they asked Jesus. He answered, bring a child to me. And he set a child down before him. And Jesus said, looking at the little child, I believe, truly I say to you, unless you are converted and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. And then he adds, whoever then humbles himself as this child, he is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. And whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to stumble, and the word stumble there is scandal on, anyone who deceives, anyone who confuses, Anyone who lies to, anyone who takes advantage of a child, says Jesus. It would be better for him to have a heavy millstone hung around his neck and to be drowned in the depth of the sea. And then Jesus says, woe to the world because of its stumbling blocks. In other words, the world has stumbling blocks especially situated so children will stumble over them. For it is inevitable that stumbling blocks come, but woe to that man or that woman through whom the stumbling block comes. Did you listen and get that, what Jesus said about children? And we live, ladies and gentlemen, in a culture, in a world where children have stumbling blocks everywhere they turn. A good friend of mine, Erwin Lutzer, who was pastor in Moody, who I think is the best biblical authority on understanding our woke culture and putting it in a biblical context. He said a woman came up to him after church and said, Pastor, I gave my 13-year-old daughter a cell phone when she was 13. And she said, I didn't know it was like giving her her first dose of heroin. That cell phone, those tablets, those computers that our children have, that is the instrument in this world that primarily educates them, gives them understanding of their emotions, of their heart, and the agenda for life. Now you can debate that, but you'll be 100% wrong that's this 
generation. Our children get their entertainment there. They get their information there. And at very early ages, most of them have seen, heard, experienced sexuality in how many countless forms. And they were not ready for this. They were not ready. Dr. Ben Carson, close friend and brother of mine, as most of you know, one of the finest brain surgeons who ever lived. He operated primarily on children, Johns Hopkins. He explained to me about the brain. He talked about the legalization of marijuana. It sounds so great. He says, what happens with the legalization of marijuana to children and young people's brain is absolutely tragic. IQ, sexual prowess, creativity, all of it gets dimmer and dimmer and dimmer because we need to know that the white gray matter and the gray gray matter, this white and gray matter that goes into the brain, it develops slowly through children, from birth slowly through children. And God in his great wisdom of creation sees that we do not develop into purity, into puberty rather, until it comes time. Hair under your arms, beard, periods for females. What a tough time of transition when all of these hormones come upon you and come upon our children. At the same time, they're viewing all of this that will scar them sexually for the rest of their lives. The New York Post, just a couple of months ago, wrote an article, a 16-year-old girl. She tells her story. She said, when I was 12, I thought, you know, everything's messed up in me. I, I'm, I shouldn't be a girl, I should be a boy. And she said she told her parents. Her parents said, oh, we, we love you and we, we want to make sure that you, you, you do whatever you want to do and become whatever you want to become because everybody told her that gender is fluid. By the way, when did biology become bigotry? Would you, uh, when did that happen, you know? She said, when I was 14, I began getting repressants of my femininity. I began to get steroid on and on. She said, when I was 16, six, 15, I had a double mastectomy waiting for a hysterectomy. Now, if you think this is rare, only in New York, wake up. Wake up! These operations are very, very expensive and very profitable for the surgeons and the doctors who play this deadly game. And in the article, she said, I'm now 16. And she said she's now going through a process of trying to reverse what had been medically accomplished. And she said, my life is in shambles. Now, interesting enough, in two European countries where this has been going along, believe it or not, longer than even the United States in great numbers of kids, two European countries have had wide surveys with literally thousands of people who have gone through sex-altering procedures. And the results is overwhelming that most of them, the overwhelming majority of them, regret it ever happened at all. And we know that most people who go through this state of confusion and dysphoria in about four years, they come out and begin to get their life together and understand that when God put a soul 
of a man in a man's body, that person is a man, and a soul in a female body, that person a female. Most of them in the long run, if radical things haven't happened, do figure it out. That's the good news. We live in a crazy, crazy world. And that's who we are. That's what's about. And it's a part of the deadly evil that we have here. I want you to listen to one of my favorite, favorite authors. I could tell you this, but I'm going to read it. Dr. Peter Kreft, Roman Catholic, teaches at Boston College, one of the greatest apologists for the Christian faith alive, prolific author. I could tell you this, but I'm going to read you exactly what he said in this area. He asked the profound question that we need to have an answer to. Why do people want to change their gender? Think about it. His answer, a biblical answer. He says, because the devil hates them and hates their happiness, so he confuses them by making them hate something good, something God designed and made, and something natural, their bodies. The devil hates everything natural because God created it. So the devil always loves to pervert natural things. The devil loves that for the same reason he wants men to hate their masculinity and pretend to be women, and women to hate their femininity and pretend to be men. The devil loves all lies. John 8, he's a liar, he's a killer. He creates stumbling blocks. He especially loves to corrupt innocent and childhood. Therefore, he loves abuse, especially by people children look up to. These who rape children's souls as well as their bodies, instead of saving them, even by doctors who surgic surgically mutilate a child's sex organs, instead of psychologically asking for the healing of their minds. Dr. Kreff writes, we should be compassionate toward people who want to change their gender. We cannot help them if we do not listen to them and understand them and feel that their souls are in the wrong bodies, that God made a mistake, that they know who they really are more than God knows. They need those struggling in these areas to find peace and unity in their identity. Our attitude towards transgender people should be the same as our attitude toward wounded soldiers. The church is indeed a field hospital on a battlefield. The church exists for the wounded. The church has only one qualification and that is to be wounded. And ladies and gentlemen, in different sexual areas, we all qualify. Is that clear enough? Is that clear enough? Now, the many stumbling blocks that our kids have to face and stumble over to tear down, jump over, go around, that's in our culture, they are especially found in our school system. You know that if you hear what has happened in California or New York, Illinois, so many states in the curriculum, and even, I said, well, those are those left-wing progressives over there, and. They're doing crazy things to corrupt the children and the agenda, what they're teaching at school. Thank goodness I live in Texas. But then I remember Austin, California, Austin, Texas. 
Freudian slip. <laughs> and I just bumped into something that in 220, the Austin Independent School District established a curriculum change. Listen, grades three through eight, Austin School District, Austin School District, our capital city, Grades three through eight, you are to distinguish biological sex, gender expression, gender identity, sexual orientation, and romantic attractions, three through eight. Also, in the agenda in the school districts, you are to teach your children to attend a pride rally and to get to know personally an LBGDQ person, the agenda in the school districts today. Central to the curriculum is what I've already said. Sex assigned to your birth doesn't necessarily mean the sex you are to live with the rest of your life. Well, that's over in Austin, in Houston. Wait a minute. Did I hear about a drag queen story hour in the libraries of Houston? Did you, did you remember that? And remember the PR that they put out about it. This isn't verbatim, but it's close. It says this will increase your children's understanding of literature. It is free, it is family friendly, and it will help you raise your children by hearing a drag queen, that is a male who has taken the identity as best they could of a female, tell stories to your children. You know, that was paid for by the taxes of the city of Houston through the library, a drag queen. I, I wonder what happened there. Do you know what happened? Let me tell you what happened. They discovered that this 32-year-old drag queen telling stories to children in the library was a registered sex offender and evidently had raped an eight-year-old boy. Oh, yeah. And the library said, oh, we didn't do our due diligence. This is a great idea. We'll get back to you and attempt to do it again. Right here in perhaps the crime capital of America, Houston, Texas. So don't get too pious. There's no room for piosity in the whole area of sexuality in your life or in my life. The bottom line is, how do you raise lambs in a culture of wolves? Did you get that? How do we raise lambs in a culture everywhere you look, of wolves. I looked up, how does a lamb defend itself? How do sheep defend themselves? They seem to be helpless to me. There are any claws, they can't run. They won't even drink moving water. How, how do we keep uh, the wolves of the culture shearing our lambs before they're old enough to know what's going on in the whole confusing area of human sexuality. How do we raise lambs in a culture of wolves? I said, you know, lambs can't defend themselves. But I, I looked it up and I found I was sort of wrong. They're slow but, and, and they don't have any claws or they don't bite, but they do have some defense mechanisms that God has given to them. They have a keen sense of smell. 
Oh, way, way out there. They have a keen sense of hearing. They can hear the crumple of a leaf way out there. And an unbelievable sense of sight do these lambs. They can see for over 1,500 yards. That's 15 football fields in distance. And I thought about that. How do we raise lambs in a culture of wolves? But they have this kind of ability. I'll tell you what, we parents, those who are surrounded with children, let me tell you what, we need to develop our sense of smell. That gut feeling you have that something's not right with Billy or with Alice. You better exercise a keen sense of smell from your gut. We do around here because we see kids when we say the light has gone out. And we notice it. All those in the business of bringing up lambs, you better develop a sense of smell. Also, you better learn how to listen. Don't talk so much. Listen, listen, listen. And ask God to help you to listen to those lambs. And then you have to see. You have to see who they're with. The families of their friends. Where they go. And that head down in that cell phone all the time. You had better be sure what's on that cell phone, in that computer, and in that lamb top. Or I'll tell you, the wolves will destroy your lamb. The lambs have one other defense mechanism. It's the shepherd. (laughs) It's the good shepherd, Christ. It's a shepherd of mom and dad. It's a shepherd of godly, loving friends. It's the shepherd you find in the body of Christ, the church. If you're trying to bring up your kids without them being faithful in training and nurture and right relationships in the body of Christ, let me tell you, there will be shepherds that'll help you build the right stuff in their lives to get them through this world and not be sheared by the wolves that are everywhere, the shepherd. Also, shepherds have with them, really many times they have with them something else. They have a sheepdog or sheepdogs, don't they? To help keep the flock together. And when one of these lambs or the ewe or the ram in a herd of sheep, they are alerted by anything. You know the first thing the lambs do? They all run together in a congregation. They all run together with the male, with the female, with the ewe and the lamb. And then... There are sheepdogs there who heard them, who will protect them, who will fight for them. But you know what happens so many times in our culture? What happened in the book of Isaiah? Listen to this. Sheepdogs, the watchman. It says, Isaiah chapter 56, his watchman, his sheepdogs are blind. All of them know nothing. All of them are mute dogs, unable to bark, dreamers lying down who love to slumber. And the dogs are greedy, they are satisfied. And there are some shepherds who have no understanding. They have turned to their own way. Let me tell you something. In all the institutions that God created, the family, government, the church, we are the watchdogs to assist the shepherds. And we can't be silent, we have to bark, bark, bark. All of this craziness 
has been under the pietistic cover of, well, we have to love everybody. In weeks to come, this book will give us a clear definition of what love is, and it's a million miles from what the Wokies would define.